بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم من يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد وفرقان الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Insha'Allah, today, as promised, we will be discussing the Holy Quran. And why is it that this book is a miracle? And because we find ourselves in this holy month in which this holy book was revealed, we find that within the holy narrations, one of the best acts that a Muslim can do in this holy month is the recitation of the Holy Qur'an. But we find that unfortunately, as we mentioned in the previous nights, it's unfortunate that especially our youth do not have this relation with the Qur'an that maybe the previous generations had. We find that unfortunately within our youth especially there are brothers and sisters who are unable to recite the Holy Quran. We find unfortunately that there are brothers and sisters who do not have even basic understanding of the Quran. We find unfortunately that within the youth especially Brothers and sisters are unable to give time to the Holy Quran. And in order to answer all of these questions, I believe that it is vital to understand what the Quran is. Because if we do not know the value of something, we cannot give it the attention it requires. For example, at home, if I have a very expensive piece of jewelry, <clears throat> I'm always cautious when I'm leaving the house where to leave it in the safe because I know of its value. Therefore, what we will try to do inshallah tonight is understand the value of the Quran. What is the Quran? And then inshallah we'll be able to implement it in our lives because this first stage is very important that we have to recognize what the Quran is, know what the Quran is. And only then can we introduce it into our, our lives. Like I said, for everyone it's different. And inshallah throughout the, the talk we will discuss how a person can increase this relation with the Holy Quran. Within logic, for example, and other sciences, it's key when discussing something to first define what you are discussing. And because we are discussing the Quran, it is vital for us to define what Quran means. This is the first stage. Quran within Arabic is derived from the word yaqra'u. Qara'a yaqra'u. Meaning to read. Qara'a is the past tense. Yaqra'u is the present tense. Read and reading. So therefore, something which is read a lot, repetitively read, within the dictionaries we find that this is given the name Quran. Like in Arabic language, it's on the same wazn as they say, on the same balance as ghufran. Quran, ghufran. 
Rojhan. These words are on the same balance as they say. Also, we find that people like Ibn Manzur in his book Lisan al Arab, volume number 11, when discussing in the letter Qaf, they come to the word Quran. He who is a compiler of a dictionary, who is renowned for being one of the most linguistic experts of his time. Some scholars have the view that he is from the Ahl Sunnah school of thought. However, some others also have the view that he is from the Shia school of thought. This is not what I want to discuss. However, what I want to emphasize is that in his time, which is about 700 years ago, he is considered one of the greatest linguistic experts to the extent that he has compiled a dictionary of more than 15 volumes by the name of Lisan al-Arab. And like I mentioned, even till today, it's accepted as being one of the most authentic and reliable sources for Arabic language. When we look in the 11th volume of this dictionary, we find that he says that Quran, other than what we have mentioned being in the meaning of reading, he says that it also comes in the meaning of compiling and gathering. He also says that the meaning of Quran is to gather. Then he proves this point by bringing the verses of Surah Qiyamah. Surah Qiyamah is the 75th chapter of the Holy Quran. And to prove his point that the word Quran also means to gather, he mentions verses 17 and 18. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alayna jam'ahu wa Qur'ana. The word Quran is mentioned in the first verse. And then it continues. فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ Qur'ana. 17 and 18, the word Quran is mentioned twice. Within the Holy Quran as a whole, the word Quran is mentioned 69 times. Two of the times are in these two verses, number 17 and 18 of Surah Qiyamah. So therefore, we need to know what this means. Ibn Fadlur is saying that Quran comes in the meaning of gathering, compiling. And when we look at the translation, it is, Indeed, it is upon us. Inna alayna, this pronoun, inna alayna, Mufassirin and commentators of the Holy Quran say this is an action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attributing to Himself. Inna alayna, it is upon us, jam'ahu, to compile it. Now, it's a very important point that I would like to discuss here. Within translations of the Holy Quran, if you remember yesterday, for those brothers and sisters that were present, there were certain questions that we were going through. And I purposely left some of the questions that had to do with the Qur'an so that we could mention them where the topic is specific for the Holy Qur'an. People usually ask, what is a good translation of the Qur'an in English? And this is one of the many examples that I could give where if you do not have a good translation of the Qur'an, it changes the meaning completely. We are discussing Surah Qiyamah, which is the chapter number 75 of the Holy Qur'an, verses 17 and 18. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that surely, inna alayna, it is upon us, jam'ahu wa qur'ana. It is upon us to compile and read it. As in referring back to the Qur'an. Some translators, in order to take the credit of the compiling of the Qur'an away from the Prophet and to other people, the member is pure, so I'm not going to mention their names. So in order to take the credit from the Prophet and to other people, they add brackets within the translation. What do they say? They say, indeed, it is upon us to compile. Everyone here is, uh, inshallah, listening. To compile. The other translations are the same. But then some translators add in brackets to take away the credit from the Prophet, to compile in their hearts. They Add in their hearts. However, this has got nothing to do with the heart. Therefore, be very careful on which translation you are reading. And therefore, I suggest that when one wants to read the English translation of the Quran, they refer to the translation of Ali Quli Qara'i. Ali Quli Qara'i has done a very, very good translation of the Quran in English. And it's a phrase-by-phrase -phrase translation of the Quran. 
and it's not in the Shakespearean form. So there's no thou, thee, doest, or theest that you have difficulty sometimes in understanding. It's a very, rawan as they say, a very easy way of understanding the Quran. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So, up to now we have discussed that the word Quran, even though has been mentioned in the Quran numerous times, we need to know what it means. And ulama say that it is from the word qara'a yaqra'u, meaning to read. Ibn Manzoor in his Lisan al-Arab, volume number 11, says that Quran also comes in the meaning of compiling and gathering. And he brings the verses of Surah Qiyamah 17 and 18 to prove this point. And as we mentioned, the whole idea of the compilation and gathering of the Quran is a big discussion and requires a lot of time. And if I had more time, I would discuss it. But I would quickly like to summarize this whole discussion. And for those that require more details, they can refer to our book on Tajweed al-Quran al-Majid. The first maybe 40, 50 pages, we have discussed the history of the Quran, which includes the compilation, includes the recitation, and other aspects of the history of the Quran. Inshallah, brothers and sisters, that require more details than what I'm going to mention here, they can inshallah look into uh, our works. So we find that when it comes to the compilation of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is an act that it is upon us. In alayna jam'ahu wa Qur'ana. So Allah is compiling the Qur'an. Through who? The Holy Prophet. Because as Shias, we do not believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bodily form. And therefore anything that the Prophet says or does, Again, in the light of the Holy Quran, وَمَا يَنْتُقَ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَا This is for speaking. So anything that the Prophet is saying are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that he does are the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, if Allah is saying that it is upon us to compile the Quran and recite it, who is going to be compiling the Quran? The Prophet, peace be upon him. Who is going to be reciting the Quran? The Prophet, peace be upon him. It's a very important point. And in order to support this idea of the fact that the Prophet compiled the Qur'an, we have to use the famous hadith of Thaqalain to our advantage here. We find that the Prophet mentioned this famous hadith that I am leaving behind, or I am the lever behind of two weighty things. Kitab Allah wa itrati ahla bayt. I mentioned this before as well, that why is it that the Prophet said Kitab Allah and he did not say Quran? Because the Prophet is leaving behind two things. One is the Quran. However, why did he refer to it as Kitab Allah? Why did he attribute to Allah and say the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Again, these are hadith that we hear, but we don't ponder upon it. And think, why is it that the Prophet didn't say Quran? Al-Quran wa itrati. Why not? It makes you think. And because we are saying that the Prophet is whom compiled the Quran. This is the vital point that we are trying to prove. In English even, if you Google it, those people on their phones, they can Google it now. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. If you Google right now, define book. Define book. Kitab Allah instead of Quran. So we want to know what kitab means. We want to know what book means because we are trying to prove that the Prophet himself compiled the Quran and not people that came after him. In English it's defined as a work written or printed. A work which is written or printed and compiled through papers. It is either sewn or glued on one side. So... Right now, those that can see me, this right now is a definition of a book. This is the definition. That it's a written or printed work on pages, and it has been glued or sewn on one side. Is everybody with me? Therefore, now we know what Quran, sorry, what Kitab means. It's a book, as we know. Therefore, when the Prophet is saying, Inni fikum 
the Prophet is saying that surely I am leaving behind two weighty things. One is the book of Allah. So that tomorrow, none of the Muslims will say that this was incomplete, this page wasn't here, this page was eaten by a goat, this was left here. The Prophet's actions are the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, anything he does is full of wisdom because he is wise. Therefore, when he is saying something, they are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when he says that I am leaving behind two weighty things, the book of Allah and my progeny, my family, we need to know that this Quran was compiled in the time of the Holy Prophet. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet is saying particular things, we need to ponder upon and think about these things. That when Allah is making the Prophet say kitab, that means that it was in this form. That it was already established and this was the complete Quran. All the discussions, like I said, after the Holy Prophet's demise are available in books. And like we referred to previously in the Quran, uh, the Tajweed of the Quran al-Majid, we have also discussed this. So, for those that are joining us, we need to know what the Qur'an means, we discussed this. And in the light of this particular narration of the Holy Prophet, we find that there is no doubt that the compilation of the Qur'an and gathering of the Qur'an as we have it today, without any additions or without any subtractions, is the Qur'an that was in the time of the Holy Prophet. Secondly, we need to know why is the Qur'an a miracle? Now that we know what the Qur'an means, we need to know why is it a miracle. And in order to do this, we need to look at the prophets previous to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Please recite aloud the salawat. It is vital that we look at the lives of the prophets previous to Prophet Muhammad. And in order to do this, when we look into the books of Qasas and stories of the, uh, the Anbiya, this is a renowned point and I'm sure even the younger brothers and sisters are aware of this. And it's a vital point that everyone pays attention to. In the time of Prophet Moses, in the time of Prophet Moses, السلام, we find that mysticism and magic was at its peak. Mysticism and magic was at its peak. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Moses two out of the many miracles that he had that are mentioned in the Quran. He gave Moses two miracles. And one was the Yadi Bayda, the hand when he would put into his pocket, it would come out with light. And the second one was his staff, his asa, and when he would throw it, it would turn into a python. Mentioned in the Quran, Surah Taha, you can refer to it afterwards. So we find that according to the climate that Prophet Moses was living in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him miracles so that he could refute the actions of the people of the time. So he was given these two miracles and the people of his time seen the miracles of Prophet Moses and seen that this is a prophet. That he has certain attributes that we do not have. He can do certain things that we can't do. And one of the ways, as you're all aware, again, discussed in books of theology, the way that a prophet claims that he is a prophet is by saying, I am a prophet, and then doing a miracle. And then showing a miracle. So we find that Prophet Moses, in the climate that he was living in, magicians and magic was at a peak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this miracle. Similarly, when we look at Prophet Jesus, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, in his time, Medical sciences were at their peak. People were able to cure people that had diseases. However, there were certain diseases that they were unable to cure. For example, leprosy. For example, people that were blind. Nabi Isa, Prophet Jesus, what did he do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through him, give him the miracles of healing the ill, bringing back the death. And therefore, when he would do this, people would look at his miracles. And because he was living in a time where medical sciences were at their peak, they would look at this and think, no, this man is greater than us. Surely he is the prophet of Allah, prophet of God. 
So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give to Prophet Jesus? He gave them, him the ability to cure the leper. He gave him the ability, the miracle of bringing back the dead. He would hit them and say, Qum bi idhni rabbi, And they would stand. So when people would see this, they would be amazed. And this was a miracle for the Prophet of that time. Similarly, when we look at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammadin wa alihi We find that in the time of the Prophet, the Arabs used to take pride over two things. It's a very important point. So we understand what the Quran is. It's only when we go through these muqaddamat, and these introductory points, do we understand what the Qur'an is? Because it's unfortunate that we treat the Qur'an as any other book. And it's only in this holy month that maybe does it come off the shelves and we have to clean the dust off it before we start you know, using the Qur'an to read. So coming back to the time of the Holy Prophet, the Arabs of the time used to take pride over two things. One was being strong men. They would take pride over being strong, fighting valiantly, courageous, being brave. They would take pride over their swordmanship, over their archery, in fighting and combat in general. This was one thing that they used to take pride over. Secondly, the Arabs of the time of the Prophet used to take a lot of pride and were proud of their eloquence in speech. They will say that we are the Arabs. There is no other person, any other nation that is able to speak with eloquence and prize like us. Even people at a young age would learn poetry. They would be fluently speaking and delivering poems. So these were the two things that the Arabs of the time took a lot of pride in. In refutation and answer of their pride in their eloquence and language, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give the Prophet the Holy Quran so that when the Arabs they would read it, they would be amazed. And in answer to their swordmanship and their fighting, combat, archery, swordmanship, their bravery, what did Allah give to the Prophet as a miracle? No one other than Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. We find that for the Prophet there are thousands and thousands of miracles that are recorded. Books are dedicated for the recording of the miracles specific for the Prophet. For example, the breaking of half of the moon. The recitation of Allah's glory of pebbles in the palm of the Prophet's hand. Many other miracles are also mentioned, like I said, in books that are devoted to this. However, the Quran is the miracle of the Prophet, which bears witness to the prophethood of the Prophet till the day of judgment. It's a very important point. So that we become aware of what the Qur'an is. The Qur'an is not like any other book. Now that it's coming in my mind, I will mention it. When we say that the Qur'an is not like any other book, there's this miraculous side. However, then there's the physical side also. What do I mean by this physical side? The Qur'an, unlike any other book, cannot be touched. I'm talking about the scripts, as in the actual writing of the Qur'an, cannot be touched without wudu. The Qur'an is amongst those things that the Ahl al-Bayt have said that there are certain things that if you look upon them, they deserve reward. For example, looking at the Kaaba. You go to Mecca, inshallah, those that have not been, inshallah, may Allah give them the opportunity of going. You go to Mecca, for example, and you're sitting in front of the Kaaba. You have now done the circumambulations of the Quran, uh, of the, the Kaaba and now you're tired. If you just look at the Kaaba, the angels are writing down the reward just for looking at the Kaaba. Looking at the, the faces of Ali Muhammad and the Prophet is ibadah. 
looking at the faces of the parents with love. This condition is added in this particular part. With love, ibadah. So na'udhu billah, never look at your parents with anger. Another thing which deserves reward just for looking at it is the Holy Quran. So therefore, if those that can hear me are unfortunate enough not to be able to read the Holy Quran, look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> is looking for the excuses, as I said, to give thawab and reward. If you can't read the Quran, let's say you're reading the Quran, you get tired. Just look at the Quran and you will get reward. So therefore, the physical aspect of the Quran is also different to other books. And we find that even looking at the Holy Quran deserves reward. It cannot be touched without wudu, spiritual ablution, spiritual washing and wiping. However, when it comes to the spiritual part of the Quran, we are discussing that it's a miracle and it bears witness to the prophet, prophethood of, of uh, the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till the day of judgment. Within the hadith, for, for example, from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, we find Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. The Quran on the day of judgment, because right now in our houses, whilst we have the Quran, this Quran is a shahid for us. It's a witness for us. And within the hadith, we find this narration in particular, Imam says that on the day of Qiyamah, on the day of resurrection, the day of judgment, the Quran will come in its physical form. The Qur'an will come out of this form and will come in its physical form to the extent that the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the human was will ask, Oh Allah, who is this creation? We have not seen someone so beautiful in our lives whilst we were on this world. And the reply will come that this is the holy Qur'an. And then it will pick Bones, as they say, and criticize and say that I was in everyone's house. I was beautiful. I was bearing witness upon your acts. But no one gave me the attention that I needed. Some people, especially the younger brothers and sisters, say, if only we were in the time of, for example, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If I was to question and say, who would like, this is a question, who would like to see the miracles, for example, of Prophet Moses, where he could throw his staff and it would turn into a snake? Everyone would want to see that. Everyone would enjoy seeing this. In the same way, if I was to ask, who would like to see the Prophet right now, for example, split the moon in half? Who would like to witness this physically? Everyone would be, let me get to the front. Let me get to the front. I want to see this. In the same way, brothers and sisters, we find that the miracle of the Prophet is in our houses. It's in everybody's home. But we do not give this attention that it requires. The book which bears witness that this is the last Prophet. Surah Ahzab says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadin min rijalikum, walakin rasulullahi wa khataman nabiyyin. وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Khatam means the seal. The seal of the prophets. So therefore, previous prophets, as we mentioned, their miracles were not everlasting. Because there was a prophet to come after them. Therefore, the following miracle would abrogate and cancel the miracles prior to this, therefore, because the Prophet is the last of the Prophets, he needs a miracle that lasts till the day of judgment. That is the Holy Quran. Now it's important to discuss, now that we discuss that the Quran is the miracle of the Prophet until the day of judgment will bear witness not to our deeds only, to the fact that the Prophet is the last Prophet and the deen al waqi and haqiqi is Islam. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Another stage that we need to discuss when discussing the Quran are the challenges that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in the Quran. Because like I said, when there is a miracle, it has to come with a claim. 
it has to come with a claim. And the claim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in various chapters and verses of the Holy Quran mentions this. For example, there are different stages to these challenges that Allah gives that the Quran is a miracle and O oh people, you will not be able to bring its like. For example, the Quran starts off by saying that if you believe that this is not a miracle, then bring a book like this. Bring a book like this, for example, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qul, لَإِنْ اجْتَمَعَ الْإِنْسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا What does the Quran say? Qul, say that if the jinn and ints, if the humans and the jinns gathered in ijtama'al jinn, ints, wal jinnu ala an ya'tu bi mithli hadha al-Qur'an if the humans and the jinns come together so that they could try and gather a Qur'an like this la ya'tuna bi mithli they will not be able to do so they will not be able to bring a book like this وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا Even if some of them were for others' assistance. So, when the Prophet is saying that this is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prove that I am the last Prophet, this is a miracle from him, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges the people and says, that if you think that you can bring a Qur'an like this, know that you can't. Even if all of mankind, all of the humans and jinns, they came together, they will not be able to bring a Qur'an like this. Then we find that in, for example, Surah Hud, which is the 11th chapter of the Holy Qur'an, Allah makes this challenge easier. What does He say? He says that if you are in doubt, that this is not a miracle from us that we have sent upon our abd, our servant, as in namely uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, then bring, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, then bring ten chapters, ashara surah, refer to surah Hud, chapter 11, bring ten chapters like this. So the first challenge was bring a book like this, then when the people seen that we can't bring something like the Qur'an, again, these are all proofs that the whole Qur'an was compiled in the time of the Prophet. Because if Allah is saying, bring a book like this, this means that there's already a book in the time of the Prophet. Because when Qul is used in the Qur'an, it is directly addressing the Prophet. Because it's upon the, the Prophet that the nuzul and revelation of the Qur'an is taking place. Very important points that I'm mentioning here. Because I mentioned that, unfortunately, people try and take this credit away from the Prophet. And these verses and the hadith that we have mentioned clearly, clearly prove that there was a book that was called the Quran in the time of the Prophet and it was compiled by the Prophet himself. So therefore, we started with the challenge which is saying that bring one book like this. Then when the people were ma'yus and unable to do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easier and said, if you can't bring a book like this, then bring 10 chapters. Then, when they even couldn't do this, when they couldn't do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prove this point, reveals in the Holy Quran, in both chapter 10 of the Holy Quran, both chapter 10 and the second chapter, verse number 23, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. إِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ If you are in doubt about that which we have revealed upon our servant as in the Prophet. إِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا On what we have revealed upon the Prophet. فَأْتُوا Then bring Come with suratin, one surah min mithli from the Qur'an. Bring one surah. Now, for those that do not know the 
this. The longest surah of the Holy Quran is the second chapter, being Surah Baqarah. The longest chapter. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Fa'tu bi suratin, bring a surah, one surah could be Surah Baqarah. But again, to make it easier for the kuffar, to make it easier for the hypocrites, what does Allah also show? <clears throat> that in the same way that the longest surah is the second surah Baqarah, the shortest is surah Kawthar. If you believe that this is not a miracle, then bring Fa'tubi suratin, the smallest surah of the Holy Quran is surah Kawthar. Bring a surah like surah Kawthar. If you believe that this is not a miracle, and you are also able to bring a Quran like this, then bring something as short as Surah Kawthar. We find that in every language, this is an important point also, we find that in every language there are two forms where the language is used. Because some people have this question, is the Quran poetry? And the verses of the Quran go against this, the hadith go against this. Why? Because people try and relate, for example, French or English to the, the Arabic of the Quran. So here there's a few questions that arise. That, first of all, we need to know that for every language, there is either nathr or nazm. For every language, there's either nathr, which means prose in English, prose, normal text. What I'm speaking now are prose. It's normal text. In Arabic, it's referred to as nathr. Or you have nazm, which is poetry. However, in the Arabic language, there's a third. Every other language only has two. Nazm and nathr. Prose and poetry. However, the Arabic language has three. Prose, poetry, and the Holy Quran. Because the Quran is not prose, and neither is it poetry, it's higher than both of them. This is why people ask, why is it that the Quran is revealed in Arabic, not Turkish, for example, not Russian? The question. Tomorrow, someone asks you, excuse me, brother, as a Muslim, tell me, why is the Quran in Arabic? I thought Islam was a religion for all. And then this is where we start thinking, oh, what shall we say? But if we read the Quran, we find that in Surah Yusuf, Surah Yusuf, the answer for this is available. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun. Surely we reveal the Qur'an in Arabic so that you understand. Surah Yusuf, referred to afterwards. Look at the translations as well. Many things that we question, the answers are in the Qur'an. Many things. Inshallah, tomorrow we will discuss where these many things stop. We find that in the Quran it's mentioned that the reason why this is in Arabic is so you understand. What does this understand mean? When we look in the tafasir, we find that the Arabic language is the most complex language in the world. Some people think, no, it's Mandarin. Why? Because you can't understand it and you think when the Chinese people are speaking, it's, you know, it's difficult to understand, so you think it's complex. No. I give this example many times that in Arabic we find that a three-letter word like Ain, excuse me for those people that have heard this before, in Arabic, we find that a three-letter word like Ain, Ain, Ya, Noon, has 80 meanings. 80. If you're not hearing me correctly, 80. 8, 0. 80 meanings. Till today, when we study Usul al-Fiqh, there's an example given. Ishtaraytu Aynan. I bought an Ain. Till today, we discuss what this could mean. Till today. When we read Usul al-Fiqh, we don't understand exactly what this means. We have to look for background, context, what this jumla, this phrase means. Therefore, also another question which is asked is, the translation of the Qur'an also a miracle? Because the Qur'an is a miracle. Therefore, if I am reading the English, Persian, Urdu, Turkish, Chinese, Mandarin, translation of the Qur'an, is this also a miracle? And the ulama say no. Why? Because when you read a translation of the Quran, this is what the translator thinks Allah is saying. Remember this point that we mentioned about Ain. 
that when one word can have so many meanings, out of the thousands of words within Arabic, the feminine versions of words, the masculine version of words, in English you have singular and plural, in Arabic you have singular, plural and dual. When there is a group where it's a mixed gathering, for example, the pronoun which is used differs. We're talking about Arabic here. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So therefore, we need to understand that the Qur'an, the reason why it's in Arabic is because the Arabic is the most eloquent and complex language of the world. Which brings us on to where we were um, just Carrying on from where we left off from when the Quran challenges the people. And for those that are joining us, we said that the Quran is a miracle. Therefore, in this holy month, we need to understand why it's a miracle. And it's only when we understand the value of the Quran, can we give it the attention that it requires. And we mentioned that this Quran is a living miracle. And it bears witness to our acts and to the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And therefore, within the hadith, we find that on the day of judgment, when it comes in its physical form, it will criticize the Muslims and say that I was in your homes. You did not give me the attention that I required being the miracle of your prophet. And finally, we mentioned that the Quran challenges that if you believe, oh people, that you can bring a book like this, bring a book like this. If you can't bring a book, bring ten surahs. If you can't bring ten surahs, then bring one surah. One surah of the Holy Quran. One surah. And we said that the show is surah, is surah Kawthar. Now within surah Kawthar, we find that the word Kawthar itself is only mentioned once in the Holy Quran. We find that inna a'atainaka in this form, is only mentioned in this surah in this particular form. In the same way, brothers and sisters, that this surah, surah Kawthar, is unique. For the lady whom it has been revealed for is also unique. In honor of Sayyidah Zahra, recite a loud salawat. Allahumma <laughs> salli She is also unique. And when the Qur'an is challenging, the Qur'an is saying, bring a chapter even like Surah Kawthar. I have about 10 minutes left, and this whole muqaddama, this whole introduction of 50 minutes is for this next 5 minutes. Everything that we've mentioned is for these last 5 minutes, so everyone's attention, especially for these 5 minutes. Because inshallah, as the servant of the community, we believe it's vital that we also address contemporary issues that are happening around the world. Why is it that people are saying that when you recite the Quran, you become na'udhu billah, a terrorist? Those people that don't have insight I'm talking about. However, those that have intellect and they are learned academics, they know what the Quran says. Why is it that Muslims, when they read the Quran, they become like this, they become aggressive, they want to attack? Inshallah, tomorrow we will continue from this. That whenever the Qur'an is read alone, whenever the Qur'an is read alone, you fall into these problems. When you say that the Qur'an is sufficient for us, Hasbuna kitab Allah, it's surprising that the people that said this first were the first people to come to Amir al muminin and ask, Ya Ali, what does this mean? History bear witness to this. The references I always say, if people require where every word that I'm mentioning is written, I will give you the references from both Ahl Sunnah books and the Shia books. We are speaking with authority, brothers and sisters. So therefore, what we are saying has weight. So, this five minutes is very important. We find that the Quran says that, بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِ In the time of the Holy Prophet, when this chapter was revealed, we find that the Prophet ordered his companions to write down this chapter, small chapter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna a'atayna kal kawthar. Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. Inna shani'aka huwa al-abbar. They wrote this down and they took it and 
the companions hanged it in the Kaaba. We find that the Kaaba was a place where specific eulogies or poet, poems were hanged there. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they were referred to as Saba Mu'allaqat, the seven tablets that were hanged within the Kaaba. One of them was Surah Kawthar. Till today in the Hawza, we study this book by the name of Saba Mu'allaqat, where these seven pieces of extremely high and eloquent pieces of Arabic, whether they be poems or this, this particular surah, we study them to see the grammatical side of it, the rhetoric side of it, and we study this as a textbook within the Hawza. Very important point that I'm making, and inshallah, say this here also, and I'll be coming off the pulpit in about five minutes. Very important point that I'm trying to make. The Quran is saying, bring one surah. The shortest surah, surah Kawthar. Surah Kawthar, when revealed, it is now placed within the Kaaba as a challenge to the people. So if you can bring something like this, bring it. We find that in this time, there was a person by the name of Sha'sha, Sha, living in the time of the Holy Prophet. Now this individual was an expert in grammar, an expert of Arabic language, a linguistic master. And what people would do was they, when writing their poetry, reading their poetry, they would refer to Sha'sha and say, take out our faults, take out any errors that we might have in our kalam. And Sha'sha said in history that he would only speak on one day. Throughout the year, he would only speak on one day. And on that one day, the whole of Mecca would come together and gather to listen that this is the day that Sha'sha is speaking. The most eloquent person of that time. In the evening, Sha'sha would come out for his, you know, nightly walk. And people would refer to him and say, Sha'sha, for example, this is my poetry, read it. He wouldn't speak. He wouldn't speak. He would have his qalam in his hand, he would read it, take out the errors and give it back. Another person would come with their poetry or their specific eloquence in Arabic and they would give it. When people became weak and they could not answer Surah Kawthar, they took Surah Kawthar and took it to Sha'sha himself. When Sha'sha took it in his hand, he began to read it with his pen in his hand. The first time he read Surah Kawthar, he could not find any errors. He read it again, thinking that maybe I read it quickly, I'll go back again. The pen was ready for the errors, read it twice. No errors. He was forced to say that Sha'sha that would not speak throughout the year was forced to speak and say, Ma hadha min kalam al bashar. This, what I'm reading, is not the words of a human. Bal huwa fawqun min kalam al bashar. It is higher than what a person is able to speak. That person that would not speak for a whole year, they will stay silent. By just seeing Surah Kawthar. And I was joking before, I said, thank God he didn't see, for example, Surah Baqarah, he would have died. Just by seeing the short Surah of the Holy Quran, he was forced to speak and say that this is folk al-kalam al-bashar. This is above what the human is able to do. This is the point that I have saved everything for. We find that after this, when the Muslims of the time, when the hypocrites of the time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, Muhammad, when the people of the time became weak and were unable to answer the Prophet through their knowledge, when they seen that we cannot answer the Prophet and we cannot give an answer to even Surah Kawthar, this is when they started to plan against the Prophet. This is when they saw that they are unable with their knowledge to battle and come in combat with the Prophet on this level. They started to plan against the Prophet. Let's kill the Prophet. Let's do this to the Prophet. Let's do this to the Prophet's family. So therefore, around the world, in Bahrain, in Pakistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Lebanon, where you see there are certain type of people that are being oppressed and attacked, Know that similar to the time of the Prophet, when they cannot answer us with knowledge, it's against us that they pick up the guns. 
It's against us that they do ter terrorist attacks. This is the same thing which is repeated throughout history. Because they do not have an answer for our knowledge. Because we are connected to the Ahl al-Bayt Show me a door that has so much knowledge that the Prophet himself says that if you want to come into the city of knowledge, then you have to come through its door, which is no one else than Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa Very important point that around the world, when you turn on the TV, you find that this is a suicide attack in Karachi, for example, target killing. This is no different from the time of the Prophet. When they see that the only way to get rid of the Shias is by killing them. We do not have answer for their books. When they do munadhara with us, when they bring their own principles of faith from our books, how can we get rid of them? We have to kill them, we have to get rid of them. So no, this is the main point of tonight's lecture. That wherever you see oppression happening, whether it's, I don't know, Saudi via Yahudi, I don't know. Wherever it's happening, you know that this is the same instance and the same repet repetition of history that was in the time of the Holy Prophet. And it's only those people that are being attacked where the enemy and opposition cannot refute an answer through knowledge. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.